All right, hello, welcome to Adventures in Lollygagging. Uh, we are back to playing Delta Green tonight. We have a full cell tonight uh, as Steven has returned. Uh, uh, little does he know uh, that the, that G Cell has recruited another member. <laughs> and so we'll see how Agent Price gone reacts. one week and you replaced me. Yeah, we'll see. But you were quite literally sleeping on the job, and this is what happens. I'll allow it only because it's an upgrade. Yeah. If you would have brought in someone worse than me, I'd be upset. Uh, just oh, so you guys that's know, actually very sweet. <laughs> I'm only moving forward with Delta Green with four players, and so this we're we're gonna treat this like. Survivor. Oh, this is the funnel. Yep. Fuck. One of you is not making it out of Wilmington, North Carolina. Just saying. <laughs> Amazing. All right, Jeff Probst. <laughs> Anyhow, so. <laughs> So yeah, so we have a very we had an interesting, uh, interesting little cliffhanger last time. Two characters are already uh, in dire straits. We'll see if either of them survive. Uh, I am uh, so happy with Maitre, who immediately crit fumbled a sanity test and has now endangered one of her fellow cellmates. She is just immediately fitting right in, like advanced <laughs> classes, boom, just like that. So excellent. Uh, but before we go ahead and kill Ashley and my trace characters, uh, let's go ahead and introduce so sorry, the characters that we're playing. Long, tell us about Agent Inferno. Agent Inferno here, being haunted by women that look like my great grandmother, and seeing visions of giant birds. And there's everything's fine. Yeah, all that checks out. Everything that everything that checks out. Uh, that's absolutely correct. Uh, I like how it's like your your grandmother. I didn't realize there's your grandmother. So, hey guys, you guys have figured out the you guys have figured out the mystery. It's it's Inferno's grandmother. Is your grandmother not living? Is she is she deceased? She's retired. She's retired. What was she beforehand? Fucked was by she, her living. She she owned a pizza haunted? shop, so she passed it down. <laughs> she owned okay okay haunted by her living grandmother pizza shop owner okay fantastic i gotta i should be writing this down uh do we have a name for your grandmother yeah it's nona nona okay <laughs> nona your business <laughs> <laughs> all right nona like grandma mean nona or like <laughs> nona Wait, everyone nona? down yeah was, we call her <laughs> nona nina or something like that <laughs> okay. No one really knows. The accent's just so heavy. It's like, I don't know. There's an N in there somewhere and maybe a vowel. There's always a vowel. Uh, so I'll figure it out. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up, Melissa, tell us about Agent Fuller House. Uh, so <laughs> you catch me on guard every time you do that. I haven't quite like gotten it in my brain that it's coming. So it's a happy little surprise every time. Uh, so Agent Fuller is the one who's currently in green box with uh, Agent Inferno, who's picturing all of these things and being haunted by all of these things. So yeah, she feels super safe right now because she's starting to get haunted by a woman too. So yay for two agents in a green box both being haunted by mm -hmm. things. Uh, hey. Typical Delta Green Day. She's a veteran. She's used to these things. Yes, we heard that you were a veteran, but were you as veteran as our next character? Because it was just <laughs> like, I'm a veteran. Well, I'm a veteran, too. Which one of them is more veteran? I'm super damaged. Well, I'm mega damaged. It was uh, it's pretty fun. I listened to the episode on very, very high speed. So it sounds like two chipmunks were yelling at each other. But uh, that's basically what it was. <laughs> so uh, let's go to our next super crazy damage veteran. Uh, Mitre, tell us about Agent Ray. Uh, Agent Ishray is, um, I, I haven't quite figured her out yet, but, uh, the two things that I'm pretty set on is that she is irritatingly procedural and also lies with impunity <laughs> and, and does not miss a beat when she is just lying to people. <laughs> so those are... The two things I definitively know about her all sorts is a drive of 20, which may or may not come up in the first yes. few minutes. <laughs> it, it, it may. It, it, when I say it may, I mean it will. Uh, but we'll see. It's possible. It's possible it could save your life. We'll find out. Next up, we've got, uh, we've got the veteran of veteran veterans. Uh, we've got Agent Price. Steven, tell us about 
that old Vinny. Uh, yeah, Vin was the first damaged veteran, so he, he he's over veteran level nine thousand. Um, and he is a uh, silver fox. Looks a lot like Don Johnson, uh, from uh Miami Vice fame. Uh, and what else do you need to know about it? He likes to fish. Um, he's an excellent father. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he's kids. plagued by sleep demons that just knock him out for entire sessions. I think he's also just demonstrated like just he's he's a very good caring. Uh, he cares cares about children, their safety, absolutely. Not, the not the younger they them. get, the better he is. Like he's okay. just one of those guys that's great with babies. Like no. they just like calm down with him. Yeah. Oh well, I was I was kind of nervous about introducing that into the campaign, but now now that I know that uh, everything should be fine. Everything should be fine. Um, and I don't know. I might argue that the first damage veteran might actually be Agent Inferno because we actually saw him get damaged in the first session, and. <laughs> Lisa too. I think she's right there. But since I did that, yeah. thought I killed the man. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, just, just arguing. Just, 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 you know, just throwing it out there for discussion's sake. Uh, Ashley, you're talking, so continue talking and tell yeah. us about Lisa. Lisa, you know, she may not be a damaged veteran, but she did save Ben from shooting himself in the face and dying. So I'd say that's pretty cool. Um, but she was a former FEMA program manager. Um, she <laughs> got in trouble for impersonating the FBI. Um, she did get acquitted, so she didn't go to jail, uh, but she lost her job. Um, her life is currently a little bit in shambles and she's trying, <laughs> she's trying to get it back on track. And then yeah. just when she thought, Hey, this mission's done, I can, you know, get back to normal. Uh, her mentor died. So, you know, just it just keeps piling. It's great. Yep. My bad. Sorry. Uh, he, his death was <laughs> foretold many months ago. Uh, OK, so, uh, yeah, I miss Ronnie already because I actually really like playing Ronnie. But uh, he, he was the sacrifice that the campaign needed. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, you know, this he, wouldn't hit as hard if he didn't die. So mm -hmm. he's one of my favorite of your NPCs. Honestly, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, I shed a tear for him that session. Maybe, maybe we'll see him again someday. We'll see in a prequel. We could we'll be do haunted. <laughs> yeah, <who knows>? oh. <laughs> or or that too. Or that too. You could be could be haunted. All right, let's go ahead and get started because I want to see who dies. Uh, so last time, uh, as we already mentioned, we saw the arrival of a new agent on the scene, uh, but this all happened during an interrogation with the original members, Sans uh, Sans Price of G Cell. Uh, we're interviewing Kurt Winter, uh, the uh, neighbor in the in the building, the Villaggio de la Sereda, uh, where where Ronnie slash Frank Ryder live. Uh, G Cell, you were interviewing him first. He did demonstrate some genuine disbelief and sadness that Frank was dead or Ronnie was dead, however you want to refer to him. Uh, he explained to you how that the two of them were friends, that they bonded over writing. And there was some skepticism towards your story, but fortunately Inferno managed to bring it back and you conjured like this cover story of you guys being friends during some of his vacationing down in, 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 uh, in Florida. Uh, but while this was all happening, uh, we saw agent Ray first, like was kind of searching around Ronnie's apartment. And then this interrogation gets interrupted by a knock on the door and in rocks agent Ray FBI badge to the face and kicked all of you out of the apartment. Uh, and that's when uh, she started pressing Kurt on specifically an email that she received uh, about that, that included a, a very cruelly w written obituary for Frank Ryder slash Ronnie. And Kurt was like, I didn't write it, even though the actual article says he did. Uh, he's an arts and culture writer. He didn't write the obituary. And plus, the timeline didn't didn't make sense because the obituary was published like or the email came like 10 hours before the death of Ronnie. So it didn't even really make sense in that way. Uh, other things, Kurt admitted that he and Frank were doing some research together uh, and uh, like urban legends and stuff like that. So eventually you kind of left the, the apartment and you met up with G cell down in the uh, down in the lobby and that eventually got moved to a Perkins. Uh, and that's where you all kind of bonded, so to speak, because the name Ronnie Lightside came up uh, and that alone was enough to kind of raise uh, raise some eyebrows. 
Uh, all of you very quickly learned that you were all were members of and familiar with the program. Uh, G cell, you, they, you debrief Ray about the very specifics about Ronnie's death. Uh, and Fuller, you had a strange moment where the light in a booth went out and from the shadows, you saw an old woman's face slowly emerge. Uh, Ray, you were telling G cell about some of the history, not, not too detailed, Ronnie, agent price, etc., And then you showed them the email, uh, about Ronnie's obituary. Weaver, you still had the burner phone that you think is, uh, is Declan. Uh, and you got a message back that said, you can stop text, uh, testing me now. I know how this works. I get it. You tried to call, uh, the voice, uh, voicemail was full still. You texted again, you identified Declan by name, uh, and you haven't actually gotten any kind of return. Uh, Fuller Inferno, you went over to Ronnie's green box. You spent a few hours there. You found some old military binoculars, some target practice silhouettes, a hundred pairs of men's cotton crew socks, some kitchen equipment with caviar in a green dodecahedron inside the fridge, an autographed manuscript for an autobiography by former Mexican president, Lazaro Cardenas. Uh, you found a detached radi radiator with a clipped pair of handcuffs, a severed female hand gnawed off at the wrist, and a very high quality top hat with the name Heavy D written inside. Um, while there, the door to the unit crashed closed, the lights went out, and then there was the sounds of laughter and breathing, and when Fuller, you tried to turn the light on, fumble for the flashlight, you saw this old woman's face uh, try to reach out for you, and then the door reopened. Uh, Ray and Weaver, you went over to Nagel's books. There, you met Jerry Nagel, the owner. He found you a copy of David J. Hufford's The Terror That Comes in the Night, an experience-centered study of supernatural assault traditions. Uh, Ray, you found a few books by Ronnie, Operatic Nights, Magnificent 12 and Retrograde, and Penny's Boat. Uh, Jerry also mentioned that Frank was having money troubles and that he offered to assess Frank's collection uh, of books and to pay him for any kind of good finds he might have. Jerry also told you that Frank had been researching the history of his building and that he had left his research there and, uh, on accident because he got distracted by something outside in the, uh, in, the, in the parking lot. And it was like a scrapbook, this photo album that he had put together. Uh, and he also handed over a couple of their odds and ends, a couple of their books here and there. As you all were leaving, though, uh, Ray, you were checking the rearview mirror as you started to turn. And you saw, looking back at you, the old crone, a woman sitting in your back seat, who started cackling. So we're going to pick up right there, uh, I think. Uh, and um, yeah, well, we're going to see how this goes. So we see that. We see Ray and Weaver. They're in the car. Fleetwood Mac was playing secondhand news. The radio starts to flicker out. The dome light overhead begins to kind of kind of rupture a bit. And then all lights on your dashboard go out as the crone is cackling from the back seat. I need you to make a sanity test, Agent Ray. Okay. Weaver, you have been looking through the photo album thing, I believe. Um, yep. You don't hear anything. You do notice the flickering of the lights, and you do see the uh, the dashboard lights go out. But you don't hear anything with the woman. That's a do? failure. <gasps> okay. Oh, God. You take three points of sand. Oh. That was max sand on that one. Take three points of sand, uh, sand loss, uh, as this is probably the first time you've seen it. I think this is the first time you've seen anything untoward. You've heard yes. stories, but it's the first time you've seen it. Yes. Uh, so as you like react, your arms start to swing the, 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 the wheel itself, the steering wheel starts to go wide. You kind of cut almost, you know, you know, without any, without, without any real certainty of what you're doing, you were literally were mid turn as you were doing that. I need you to roll a drive at minus 10. So roll drive. Minus 10. So you have a one can in 10 I, chance of not. Yes. <laughs> yes. Got it. With that, you can get back up to a 30. Yeah. Oh, shit. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. Oh, critical failure. Oh, goodness. Um, okay. So. Fuck, as, I'm so sorry, Ashley. As you turn. As you turn, you can lose complete control of the vehicle. You look up once more as you're kind of spinning and you feel yourself, the, the car is kind of getting ready to tip. You lose sight of the woman in the actual backseat. She's not there. And as you try to cut the wheel back to get control of it, you look out into the road and there she's in the middle of the road. And so you swerve again. And all of a sudden, the car flips and tumbles, 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 tumbles into 
Uh, well, roll luck test. Roll. Give me. Give me a d100. We'll see if it, it hits anybody. If you. If you. If it's anybody or any other cars, or if it just manages to get to the side. Okay, so it does manage. You don't manage. You manage to get out of the way of other people. It's like it, you just get super lucky. And it doesn't hit any other cars. Doesn't hit any pedestrians. But we see it go flipping and rolling and rolling off. We'll say the side of like maybe you're turning onto the highway and you're and you're kind of stumbling down now this uh, this on ramp and you go off to the side and you go tumbling down the side of it. Um, the car is going to be totaled in the process and both of you are going to take four points of damage. Uh, as you get thrown around inside the car. Okay. So as it comes, doosh, doosh, doosh. so as it comes to, uh, as it comes to a stop, eventually you all are up. The two of you are upside down. I, I'm pretty sure both of you are still conscious, uh, as it was only four points and suddenly the light, the dome light flickers back on the dashboard lights flicker back on. You hear the final couple lines of secondhand news, the Fleetwood Mac song, veer out and then kind of bend like second and then the car shudders. Weaver, you smell smoke. You smell gas. Uh, the entire, like you're hanging uncomfortably, obviously, but all your things are on the ground uh, and you can smell immediately that the car is in trouble and you look out the, the, the front of the windshield and you can see some like liquid it's dripping down from the crumpled uh the crumpled hood of the car uh weaver i'm gonna give you a chance it's like ray is uh ray is currently under sand issue right now so go ahead and what does what does reaver do first um basically she just like unhooks her seatbelt and ray's seatbelt and then she grabs the books that she has and she's gonna if she has to like kick out the window she kicks out the window to try and like get out okay uh, roll a, what do you have for search? Give me a search roll. Oh, 23. Okay, let's give it a roll. This is basically to determine how much stuff you get before you pop out. Oh, fuck. 24. Uh, 24. You, it, I'm not going to treat it like a binary thing. Like, you get some stuff, but you maybe leave one or two things in here. You don't even probably notice that you left some stuff in there. But I'll say, obviously, the the, the priority was, like, you know, the big book, yeah. the big photo album by uh, by Ronnie, but maybe a couple of the other ones that you didn't notice tinkered off into the back a bit. And you, the two of you, you climb out of the car. Both of you are, you know, you got glass in your foreheads and your cheeks. Your arms might be busted here or there. And we'll say that w when we see you, you're on the side of the road. Cars are starting to pull off. Some people are coming to check in on you. You hear the distant sound of an ambulance. Uh, that's maybe somebody, uh, uh, sort of an onlooker calls and the two of you are, are just as it there. fades out. You hear Lisa turn to Ray. What the fuck? And <laughs> so how do you respond, Ray? How's Ray doing? Uh, not well. Um, she's kind of shaking and, um, stammering, uh, wo woman, the, uh, the, there was a woman. There was a woman. The woman. Woman. Um. And she just kind of manically is stammering. Before like people approach us, um, Lisa's gonna try and slap her out of it, like actually slap her out of it, kind of like get her senses back in. So she just kind of will like have her hands on your shoulder. Okay, okay. We told you there was a creepy hag. We knew this was coming in. And then she'll like do the whole like, come on, get it in. Give, give me a Sibbies psychotherapy roll. There's an actual, yeah, there's an actual role for this. You can roll psychotherapy to like break her out of an event. Like, you know, bring her I back from the take edge. One. <laughs> this is why Lisa isn't with FEMA anymore. Like you Dude, just went through damage a Damage veteran, Things right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and to some degree, she Hell reaches yes. you, right? To some degree, she does reach you. Like, you get her voice, like, you hear her, and then you hear the siren pierces through. You see that there's cars around, and the two of you are on the side of the road by a demolished car that is now slowly catching on fire. This is an incident. How do you two want to handle this? We need to go. We need to go. I mean, it was just a car accident. I, I mean, we should make a statement. Uh, should no, we, no. We, we need to go. We need to go. All right. Well, 
fuck. This is bad. This the car is rented. You rented this car. Did I, you rent it under your name? I, I, I can't remember. I'll, I'll, Fucking paper trails, Ray. Paper trails. I'll, remember, I'll think back. Look at my... I can't... Not right now. Agent... And and she summons all the fucking strength she can to get to her feet and start moving away. Okay. Um, are you just going to bolt and try to, like, hop over the fence pretty and away much, from the highway? Okay. Pretty much. <laughs> Whatever is the closest route to physically getting away. Okay. How about um, both of you? Give, so you're going to get away. That's not a problem. Both, both of you roll a stealth test to see if this is essentially just to combat anybody who might have seen you, be able to recognize your face, etc. So just roll. Give me a stealth roll. And both of you roll your own because it's possible <laughs> one might be seen and not the other. We've got some boost left. Yeah. Um, can I any. take two, please? <laughs> <laughs> I would like one. All right. Uh, it's a fail. Okay. Oh, what was your? What was the fail. total? Uh, Give me the total though, because it's always over thirty. Oh, Lisa, that's not good. Seventy-eight <laughs> over forty-four. <laughs> oh, yikes! All right. So the two of you run. You hear a couple of voices like, "What the? What way are you going?" Is it uh, And you hop over this this chain link fence, and you find yourselves in like some kind of small industrial area on the side of the highway, and you just start running. And behind you, as you look over your shoulder, as the sun's coming down, it's getting kind of dark. You can just see the black smoke of your vehicle beginning to float up into the sky. And it's at this point we'll go ahead and cut to Inferno and Fuller, uh, who are in the you're still in the green box. You're still in the green box for uh, for Ronnie. Uh, I gave you the list of the things that you had that you had you had discovered. Uh, The door has crashed back up. There's light back in that that creepy crone woman is gone. Uh, you don't see her anymore. Fuller, you're probably just coming back from a bit of a and you, know, you are the one who saw it. Inferno didn't actually see it this time. What are the two of you doing? Did, did the lights go out when that happened? Yeah, the light, the overhead lights are the halogen lights. They flickered out. Then the crash came. The door crashed. Everything was black. And then Fuller pulled out her like a flashlight, but it and as she pulled it up and turned it on, the face of the crone was directly in her face and kind of reached for her. And that's when Fuller dropped it on the ground. And then since then, the doors now come back up. The lights have flickered back on. And you guys are you guys are OK. Peek out the hallway and see if that was like an entire facility sort of outage. Other people affected or is it just us. Uh, looking out there, you don't see any issues with the lights. You see that as you look down the hall one way, the hall the other way, lights overhead look fine. Uh, it doesn't, if it, 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 there's other people around here, uh, at this time of day, it's late, in, late in the afternoon, early evening. So you're welcome to ask people, but you can't see any, any evidence that this was like a, a, a situation that happened across the entire compound. Where are you going? Are we not done here? Did you not just see that? Yeah, the lights went out. Not just that, the woman, the her face. You didn't you you didn't see that? If she mentions the woman, I get flashbacks to the elevator ride. Yeah, I've seen a woman before. And so she'll describe what she like she was like right in my face and she'll, she'll describe the crone did did you see something like that too yeah back at the Bellagio hmm um so you tell um, me she followed us all the way out here there's it's something that we're all seeing this all of us well you and I and we'll have to see um uh, and she'll kind of look around. And I had a question about the crew socks. Was that like of course packages? You do. Yes. Of <laughs> so uh, like packages of crew socks. Like did we see. open them? A hundred is a lot. Just want to make sure. 
Uh, I don't like recall something. They were they're brand new, uh, but I don't know if they're all in like one single package or they're all like grouped up into multiple packages. But they are brand new. Okay. Uh, Fuller wants to test that theory, so she's gonna like rip open a bag and just throw one of these bags of crew socks. Just maybe something's hiding somewhere. I don't know. So you rip open the bag? I do. Okay. So right as you rip open the bag, you are hit in the face by the smell of fresh socks. And then you start throwing them all over the place, thus moving that scent of fresh socks all around. You are you off your rocker. What are you doing? I, and she's like opening the pairs and unrolling them and looking. I, I just, there's, hmm, I just, I just had to make sure. You never, I don't, under crew socks in it. This is not what this, these, these places are not for things like that. This is not like your closet. This is not where you put clothes. Yeah, but tell that to Ronnie. Let's get out of here. I would. It would. What the hell was that? He's dead. Why would you say that? Never mind. And she just like puts things back. And okay. Can we do it very quickly? I just want to get an inventory of what you take uh, out of the box. Okay. Yeah, I took the dodecahedron caviar, okay. and I believe there was booze. There was, yeah. Yeah, uh, to take Edron, caviar, and booze. Got it. And then what about you, Fuller? What do you take? 99 pairs I of take, fresh socks. I take the... I'm going to take one pair of those socks just for reasons. And the manuscript. The autobiography okay. manuscript. So they're in packs of um, like six-ish or so? And then... You took the manuscript? Okay, got it. And the binoculars, because I just want to... Take the binoculars? Oh. <laughs> yes. Okay, <laughs> got it. All right. <laughs> so, you guys get all that kind of stuff. I'm sure you have bags. Put it back in your car, and you head out. Where do you head next? When you get out, by the time you get out, because you spent hours in there uh, going through everything. It was like a hoarder's closet, right? Uh, so by the time you get out there, it's late afternoon, early evening, sun's going down, not fully down just yet, but where are the two of you plan to go next? What's your idea? And I'll head back to meet up with Vinny, see how he's doing. Okay. All right. Yeah. Maybe he finally woke up. All right. So you two hop in your car and you start heading back to the motel. We cut to the motel. We see a sleeping Vinny. There he is. He's on the, uh, He's on the mattress, the same mattress that he had that experience with uh, the night. But he, you, you do see him, in fact, sleeping, and he kind of rolls around a little bit here and there. But then, Vinny, you you hear tit 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 tit. You hear this tapping, this flat, and like this kind of like. It's like very faint at first. There's a couple very faint taps and then there's like a slap or a flap of some kind and it wakes you up and you're in your room. There's a very faint bit of light coming through the curtain still. Uh, you feel refreshed actually as you feel like you have gotten some sleep, but you, that sound that ting, ting, flum, continues to happen. I'd imagine it would be a bird or something like that, I think. So I'd probably check out the window. Okay. You head over there. And as you kind of pull back the curtain a bit, you see that there is a a dead body of a uh, very large moth uh, or butterfly on a windowsill right here. Uh, sort of like in some way you can see it's kind of part of it as you pull the curtain back. There's one portion of like one of its arms or legs kind of clutching a bit to the fabric and it slides uh, along the windowsill briefly, uh, but then comes to a stop and it's there and it's like a husk. Like on the inside of the room? In the inside of the room, right there on the windowsill. Uh, I'd grab a tissue or some toilet paper or something and go to just crush it, throw it in the trash. 
Okay. Uh, give me a, uh, really quick, give me a, like, we'll say a retroactive, like, alertness we can do. Or are you going to be just doing intelligence? Intelligence time five. Either um, I'll always go alertness because my alertness is 90 and I rolled a 44. That's a crit. Uh, okay. So as you go to crushed up, you take like a, a, a some sort of, you know, you grab a, some tissue nearby and you go to right as you're going to, to put your hand down over top of it. Maybe the angle you approach this time, you look down at it and you swear you have seen this before. It's the size of a fist. It's not small. Like this thing's like not maybe it's not quite that big, but it's very, very big. And it dawns on you that on the shelf of Ronnie Lightside slash Frank Ryder's apartment, amidst all of the other accolades, awards, photos, books, etc., there was a kind of framed and displayed one of these, kind of pinned up the way like a a biologist might pin or a person who collects butterflies might, might collect and it was just there. It looks exactly like this one. Exact same pattern in the wings. Size looks about right. All of that. When I make that connection, I might be a skeptic, but coincidence is my job or something like that is what Ronnie would say. Um, and I pick it up carefully uh, sure. with the tissue and I, I look around for some sort of like package or something I can put it in that would protect it. Uh, yeah, you guys have like evidence yeah. bags or something maybe. That's yeah. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you wake up, you look around, you feel a little bit refreshed. You take a D six willpower back. You, you take this, this bug. Very nice. Uh, it takes five. Uh, and no one else is here. So it's, just you. What's price due at this point, you think? I would text Luca, I think. Okay. Uh, I'm sharing a room with him, so I think that kind of makes sense. Uh, where are you at? I can come meet you. We'll say you, you get pocket. that text. Yeah, while you're in the car, we'll say the text yeah, comes. Yeah, tell Fueler it's probably price. Can you get that? Yep. So, um, what do you text back? Um, just say, um, coming to you. Okay. You get a we'll thumbs say, up back. Oh, look at you using emojis. Old guy. Nice. Modern man. What were emojis <laughs> a few effective? minutes later. Yeah, a few minutes later, we'll say the two of you arrive at the motel. Go inside. There's Price up. Looks Looks a little bit refreshed. Doesn't look as kind of pale and he's moving around as well fuller uh which he wasn't uh so so well last you saw him in the morning but there he is and the three of you are now together still no sign of weaver or ray currently we were at one of your favorite places Vinny. the green box what do you have i'll sort of I'll have a lot of socks that makes sense he liked buying things in bulk hundred socks in a green box. You go there well, looking for things to help us, not your clearance sale hall. And she like throws down the pair of socks on the bed just in like frustration. See, and Vin still doesn't know Fuller that well. So he's like kind of keeping up the, like just the impassive face. Uh, but he does kind of cock his head at that. Like, why do you care so much about socks? Uh, before recovering, well, while well, you out were, you both were out discount shopping for socks. I actually managed to find a clue in our own room, and I point towards the moth, which would be on like the desk or something like that. Sure, one of those was in Ronnie's apartment. Fuller, you would know from looking at this that one of these was also in Kurt Winter's apartment. This was, this isn't actually the second one. This is the third one. Ronnie, Kurt, and now you. That is not a coincidence. And she doesn't say that like in an antagonistic way, but just sort of like, this is solid. Um, and then um, I saw that Ashley had thrown in chat that I looked up and researched like what kind of moth right. it is. So that is information that I know. Um, 
also known as a go ahead Ashley I saw you unmute dead it is a, death's I, head I have it if you hawk it. Yeah. moth okay that the one from Silence of the Lambs um I don't know I'm not sure actually I don't remember be. what was in um it is okay. according to Wikipedia well there we go probably intentional I would also, imagine people who wrote this probably intentionally also known as an omen of of death. So that's unsettling. So I don't a bit of a moth into omens. Bit of a moth inv infestation, huh? Just migration. What's going on? Well, the other two were pinned up on the wall but um and then she dumps this big manuscript um and then there's also this was in the green box and so she she <laughs> kind of dumps onto the desk this manuscript autobiographical signed manuscript of a former mexican president and military binoculars also things that were in the green box So there was more than just socks. Good to know. Uh, and I just like <laughs> casually flipped through the manuscript. Okay. Uh, as this is happening, let's check back in with Weaver and Ray who have been running through uh, in a way. Uh, they've been running away from their accident site through this like closing down industrial side that kind of runs parallel, we'll say, to the highway. Where are you two heading? What are you doing? If Weaver doesn't have any recommendations, uh, Ray's going to say, uh, let's get a cab and go back to your hotel. Assuming you're from out of town, I just assumed you were from out of town. Yeah. Uh, are you sure we want like a cab driver to like recognize us? How else are we gonna get back? I don't like cab <laughs> I mean, I doubt they'll pay much that much attention to us. Okay. Okay. Uh. All right. All right. Uh, the after things like this, it is best to be as normal as possible. Okay. This is my. Okay. Uh, all right. I will follow your lead. Okay. She's gonna try and hail a cab. Get a cab. <laughs> and look Not at an issue. Take off her jacket because that's presumably like it's completely wrecked. <laughs> you're probably you're probably gonna have to call a cab over to you, uh, as is Wilmington. So you probably call totally a cab. <laughs> um and the two of you get in the car, you say you drive back to Weaver's motel, and we'll say that you slam the door on your own room right as price says something along the lines of great so there's more than just socks in here and all of you here are the slam of the adjoining room that fuller and weaver have been sharing uh signifying that they might might have returned did weaver go off on her own oh i've got to tell you i'm a new agent a new Game agent button. FBI, she came looking for Ronnie. She's with the program. You know this for a fact. And Fuller's just going to go knock on the adjoining door. Lisa answers and she kind of looks like she's been in a car accident. Yeah. She yep. looks like shit. Hair <laughs> oh covered my gosh. in. And, and broken glass. Kind of in, like, look in a mirror, like, trying mm -hmm. to <laughs> fix as they much as They smell like gas. Can. Yeah. <laughs> what, what the hell happened? Uh, I I lost control of the car. Uh, there was that Hold up. woman. There was a woman. Penny? Uh, 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 Vin. What the hell are you uh, doing? It's it's uh it's it's Isha now, uh actually. Isha. Ray. 
Issa Rae. Jesus Christ, how long has it been? Fucking too long. And she Wait, walks did up you say and your gives name is fucking hug. Penny? No. And she There's a whole ass book dedicated to you. Yeah, I I didn't know that. I I didn't know that till we had gone to Jerry's. You look like shit. And you would see Vin doesn't look good either. He had the worst night of sleep of his life. He was shot recently, so he's probably looking like weakened and emaciated. He's also got a new star (laughs) on his cheek uh, where he was shot a couple months ago. And you fell down the stairs and broke your nose. Oh, uh, yeah, and I've got a broken nose. Thanks for the reminder. He keeps going after the moneymaker. She's uh, recently been in a car accident. She kind of looks pretty much exactly like you remember, except she's got white in her hair now. Uh, but she is just as like stiff backed and like, a- except for the fact that she's just been in a car accident and, and she looks it. Um, yeah, which but, we but ran away from. She she does come up to you and, and give you a, a hug. Like, kind of I, stiffens up a bit, but he does does reciprocate. I, you know that I, he's always been one that's weird about like yeah public yeah. displays displays of affection. It's just good to see you. Uh, and so Fuller same. kind of because Finn had been so suspicious, and so Fuller's like, uh, so a- agent. And then she looks back at Weaver, car accident. And you walk. You just left. There, there was this woman who showed up in the back seat. That you, you were telling me about that old woman that was haunting you at lunch. I think it may have been her. And Fuller she, will kind of go into another description when when we were at the green box and the lights went out and like right in my face. I lost control like, of the car. I. I tried to slam on the brakes. I I tried to Blair. I'm I'm sorry. I I really did think it was the best thing for us to leave the site. Yeah, like, cops are a bother. I get it. Ah, uh, well, witnesses. I don't know who fucking saw us. Like, well, it just the, stresses we me out. We'll deal with all of that as it becomes a problem. Yes. But- uh, and like, mind you, this whole time, Lisa's been like in and out of the bathroom and like she still has the door open because the guys are in the other room and like she turns on the shower, but she's not shutting the door because so much freaky shit has been happening. And so she will actively take a shower with the door open with Ray, like right there kind of nearby because she's got glass and shit she needs to get rid of. <laughs> no shame in Lisa's game. She's got a kid. She's got. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, no, Ray is entirely too, like, prudish for that, so she's just, like, not even looking <laughs> at you uh, while she, she talks. She doesn't even ask if this is okay. <laughs> she just goes. Uh, but, and, but, um... And there's a moth. Moth. Third moth. He just found it. Like, just now? Or last night? Or when did you find it, Price? A moth? 20 minutes ago. It was in the motel room. What? Maybe it caught on to our clothing when we were in in Ronnie's apartment. Who knows? But it, it, it wasn't flying around Ronnie's apartment. It was like science experiment posted on Maybe the wall Maybe there was a second apartment. one. We don't know. We can't rule anything Taxidermy. out. Taxidermy. And thank you. Thank you. And the same thing in Kurt's apartment. And it's an omen. So of- they had a source of them. And Fuller just. So we're all seeing a woman. And now there's moths accumulating. Meanwhile, uh, Ray's eyes go to the binoculars on the table. And uh, she kind of walks over and picks them up. She's like, where did you find these? Under a pile of socks, apparently. As we found it as a what? green box. Oh, 
Uh, okay. And now uh, she puts them down wordlessly. What about the bookstore, though? How'd that visit go? We had to leave most of what we bought in the car, and we had some really excellent things. I I don't know if you were able to grab anything, Blair. I I wasn't. Uh, I like to think that she got the two books that she really wanted, so the scrapbook and then the terror that comes in the night. Yeah, I'm fine with it. But uh, I think the rest yeah. she would be like, not my problem. Yeah, I'm okay with it. Uh, so yeah, there's like a big photo album um, that's like something you would get from like a Walgreens or whatever, like some pretty cheesy looking thing. When you open it up, whoever does, uh, you can see that there aren't photos really inside as there are more like scraps of photo like uh, photocopied articles some of them newspaper articles some of them are uh like almanac kind of stuff it, it really does seem like this is something that a person in this case ronnie has compiled over time um at first glance it seems first page it has to do with the villaggio de la sorella uh, and it is the building itself. And you can see that there is like this, uh, the first like entry, the first photograph entry is from 1892. Uh, and it's uh, January 7th. The building opened after two years of construction. Uh, the building is named after Christine Salmon Wolf, Deirdre Salmon Frey, and Elizabeth Salmon. Um, they're all heiresses to the kind of salmon munitions fortune. Um, there are some on like the first couple of pages you've noticed Fuller. Are you the one looking at it? Fuller? Is that fair? Cause I know Weaver was in the bathroom or yeah, taking a shower. Showering. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And Price had grabbed the manuscript. Okay. So yeah, that works. So you notice that in the first couple of pages, there are newspaper articles about the opening. Um, and then you notice that there are, one of those actually has an old photo uh, from the day of the opening, and it includes images uh, of the three women that are listed, uh, all in their 70s or older. So they're all standing in front of the, of the building itself, which is over 100 years old. One of those images is circled. And as you look at it, and as you look at who it is, it's Elizabeth Salmon, you absolutely recognize the face. It's a, it's a touch younger but it is the face that you saw in the darkness of the green box. And I need you to roll sand now, Fuller, for that. Oh, gosh. Rolling sand. Uh, 13 under 50. Okay. You're keeping it together, but maybe your hands maybe tremble a little bit or like you jolt, whatever it might be. Uh, but you recognize the face for sure, without a doubt. You said Elizabeth Salmon? Yes. And now there's Fuller more will pages probably, to this. yeah, and she'll kind of stop with that and she'll kind of pick the picture up and, you know, kind of like throw it down. That's the woman. That's the woman. And she'll kind of, she's kind of like waving right over. Like, that's the woman. That's, it says Elizabeth, but that's her. Right? That's totally her. Does that look like the woman I saw? <laughs> so Inferno and Ray, both of you recognize the face of the woman that you saw. And both of you now need to roll sand tests. Uh, <laughs> that's Price, her. That's I, her. Price, you saw the face at the um, at the accident. So you would need to roll it as well. Only Weaver doesn't have to roll it. because But I was looking practicing. at the manuscript and I that's was fair. minding my own business. If you're doing that. But your alertness is so high. God damn it. <laughs> damn it. <laughs> right, I'll roll. Success. My first success. <laughs> All right. There you, you know, go. Evil. Zero one. Uh, nice. That's a one pointer. And don't forget, you can always push your sanity loss onto your bonds. Uh, right. I failed mine. One point of loss. Uh, that's all it is. Okay. So I'm now so close to my breaking point. I'm one away. Okay. Well, you can push it off. Fuck. But you ju- you're pretty low in willpower, though. So. Okay. So. As you guys are standing around and as Fuller drops this, um, she drops this, uh, 
photo album right there on the bed. You all recognize this kind of red circled photographed or excuse me, photocopied like old article from a newspaper a hundred and something years ago. And you see the face, you see the name, all of you recognize it. Um, there's no writing that seems to be going along with it, but you would presume if, if Ronnie's the one who collected this, that might've been Ronnie who circled it as well. What do you guys do? So we know who's haunting us. Uh, let me keep looking through this and see if we can figure out why then if we've got the who let's try to figure out the why so fuller will kind of go back to flipping through okay. the scrapbook uh okay well if you if you just go in direct order you see the next entry that he seems to have compiled has to do with 1913 uh specifically in the early morning hours of april 25th a fire broke out and it killed three residents the fire apparently started in the top front apartment uh, where, uh, like street side, where an elderly woman, Imogen Nalotsky, uh, she was 69, uh, she fell asleep in apartment 19 while smoking. And also killed in the fire were David J. Harris and his wife, Mary Ann, of apartment 18. They were both in their 50s. All of the residents made it to safety. And so you can see that he's got a page that has a couple of different articles and references and such, uh, kind of compiling what actually happened. You just tell me what how much you want to keep going. What apartment did they live in? The other people? 18 and 19. 18. So 19 was the one that was uh, where the woman the where the woman died. And 18 is the one that um, the two that were able to escape. Okay. And does anyone remember Ronnie's apartment? I was just going to say, is either of that either Ronnie's or Kurt's apartment? So you all have been in the, in the apartment a couple of times now. Uh, so you would know that Ronnie's apartment is 11. Uh, so, you, and you would think that, you know, that the, the building itself only rents four floors out, but you also noticed from the, from the street, there is like a windows for like a fifth floor. But as far as you know, there's only four floors being rented out. And I think Kurt is, is in five. Uh, Kurt five. is on the second floor and he is in, yeah, apartment five. So the people you have met so far, you would know that, uh, so Bill and Connie Duke are on the first floor. So is Todd, Todd Beach, the superintendent. He's in three, um, they're in one, uh, you have met Bridget and Naomi. You're not actually sure where they are at, but they just keep popping up. Uh, then, uh, you know, that Maddie, uh, she lives across from Kurt or excuse me, across from Ronnie. Uh, and so she's in apartment nine and Inferno, you went and met uh, Mary Elizabeth Moangelo uh, and she's in apartment 10 on the same floor as Ronnie. There's about four apartments per floor. Uh, so you would think that if it's 19, 18, those are the ones that are um, a little higher up. And I would say, unless other people interrupt her, Fuller would keep flipping through the scrapbook. Sure. Uh, okay. The next entry you find is is in uh, for 1921. That's the next issue or the next uh, like incident he seems to detail. February 23rd, an eight-year-old by the name of William Dodge in apartment seven dies of an undisclosed illness. And he has a copy of the... Uh, the child's uh, obituary. And it says, William Eric Dodge, 1913 to 1921, aged eight years, died Thursday of natural causes at his home in the Villaggio de la Sorella. Uh, William is survived by his parents, Matthew and Caroline Dodge, and two younger brothers, Richard, age five, and Stephen, age two. William Dodge was a bright and creative boy and a beloved son. Death is believed to have been due to complications from a recent illness. Memorial services are to be held Monday morning at 11 a.m. at the Crater Sterling Funeral Home with intermittent, uh, excuse me, with interment to follow at Blackwood Cemetery.
And Fuller would say, so if Blackwood Cemetery is close by where this uh, poor boy uh, and perhaps others who passed away in this uh, building might uh, be in the same cemetery, perhaps, if that's local. Um, and she sort of like looks around to kind of check in and see what other people were doing while she's looking through all of this death and everything in this book. Ben learned his lesson, started keeping his head down when you kept flipping through pages. But your alertness is just too high. <laughs> Your peripheral vision is like 40 40. Yeah, I would be listening along. I took along. the one chair in the motel and turned it towards a corner. <laughs> Inferno, you're listening along, and what else? I would be like staring at that moth that was newly found, just poking at it, lifting up to the light so you can see anything. Okay. Um, I don't, I think Fuller got all of the the info about its meaning but if you have some kind of like if, if you have like a, an in test or a biology test or, or anything like that you could potentially roll you can certainly do that um if you have science would be the ideal thing don't have any of that so i'll just do a straight in okay you got this Five under 55. Okay. Nice. Uh, so you can confirm what Fuller managed to say uh, and that it is like, it's called a death's head hawk moth. Um, and as again, it's about the size of a palm or a fist. Um, what I'll say is because you just did int, you probably know that sometimes animals are given Creatures are given their names um, based on certain like mythos and mythology, that kind of stuff. Uh, so, and you remember seeing in the apartment that there were various like books on mythology and various cultures like Norse, Scandinavian, Greek, Roman, etc. cetera. Uh, and while I'll say your int doesn't necessarily give you the answer to what this might represent or anything like that, it does at least give you that thought, we'll say. Cool. Then I'll make plans to do a proper stakeout where it wants to join me. Kind of just look at the building, see who comes in and out, kind of people that live there. Okay. Vin is always up for a stakeout. We'll say at this point, Weaver, you come out of the shower. Are you feeling Dress, better? Uh, I have, as good as it's going to get. Uh, I got that other book that we couldn't find um, in uh, his apartment. So. I mean, he was he was doing some research. There's, I mean, I guess any building is going to have some death and whatnot, but I've got, this is a scrapbook of death and just awful things. And um, we seem to have identified the woman that's been haunting us is one of the sisters that this building was built after so oh, the original creators uh yes. interesting uh have you noticed any like uh uh patterns in the deaths of of the that he's collected like is there a certain amount of years between the deaths uh I'm going to have to spend more time with the book, um, I think. Uh, so far, I've got a woman who was smoking um, and a kid who had complications from an illness. So I, I'm i going to have to kind of look at this stuff a bit more. Um, but there's more upstairs folks, it looks like. Yeah, there was that other floor that we haven't been up to yet. Yeah, that's where some of these uh, folks were living. There's like an 18 and a 19. and so. You know, we also haven't met the actual owner of the building yet either. Or most of the people that live there to actually kind of talk with them. Yeah, uh, I think kinda, some of it's just been in passing. We kind of fucked that right up. Uh, and she she's just going to sit down on like her bed Fuller, or whatever. Filler just kind of looks to Ray... I was going to go do some interviews. Um, 
Not until maybe tomorrow or something, though. Um, actually, uh, if, if you makeup. are in town, makeup. It, we can definitely. Um, this is not the first time I've been bruised up and need to cover it up. Don't. It, it, it's fine. Um, I am gonna go check out of my hotel though, and we check in here. Um, so might I might as well just join our sleep. room. I'd I'd prefer to to have a room to myself if if you don't mind. Uh, really, when we're haunted. Yes. Okay, and and like Weaver doesn't push, but like she does definitely give you a look like. Being solo might not be a great idea. Sure. Penny knows what... Isha knows what she's doing. And it's not like me being here in the same room with Luca helped me at all. Yeah, did uh, did we tell you that he... They both had, like, nightmares of the hag lady, just like what Ronnie had? No. You had She, nightmares. like, crawls on top of you with her knees on your chest and you just are stuck laying there? We don't normally and, share bad dreams. I had a rough night, that's all. This may be more than just... But it was this dream. woman, right? And... I, seen it. I don't think it was. They, they, yeah. they, neither they of them saw a face. The face. Just a uh, dark presence. Alright, well, um, I will be back as soon as I can be. Alright. Okay. And uh, uh, she kind of heads out uh, to her hotel. Uh, Jeff, we don't have to role play this out, but but let me know what needs to be done mechanically. Um, I was giving this some thought, and her standard process, because she, she, this is who she is, is that like when she rents a car or anything in a new place, she does have a pretty high comp side bureaucracy and law. Um, when she rents a car after she's rented it, she goes into their system and modifies who it's been rented by. Like, she changes the details of who rented it so that uh, it okay. is not traced to her. That's going to require a computer science test, I think. Hell yes. I am yeah. more than happy to make the roll. And can I please have audience we'll do, sites? Because I we'll do a really retroactive... Wonder. Yeah, for this for the the budget rent a car system. Amazing. Yeah, if uh, if I because I I really want to succeed at this. So. Yeah, go for it. Thank you. Hell yes, twenty six okay. under fifty. Yay. Yeah, I mean it's something you've done multiple times. Uh, maybe you specifically rent from budget all the time because you know like the back doors into some of their Amazing. Uh, yeah some of their Perfect. their national database the and such. Security is really bad or something. <laughs> Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, we'll they say you're a able, budget. <laughs> <laughs> we'll say that you're able to uh, to direct it to it like a, a maybe a dummy, um, like a dummy identity that you might have, not necessarily like an actual person, right? Or would you? No, want no, to be an it's person? it's just it's it, it, she does like a random name generation uh, thing. Okay. Yeah, we'll say that. Yeah, that's no problem. Um, do you take a, like a cab and such back to your? Uh, to, I, to I do take a cab right. back to the hotel, um, not one that's been uh, gotten by the hotel, like she hails one on gotcha. the street. Okay. Um, I don't think you can expect... really hail one on the street in Wilmington, North Carolina. Oh, okay. I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. This is me being Canadian. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> There's like certain cities you could do that in, but Wilmington's not one of them. Uh, okay. And, well, yeah. uh, 2011, there's... Are there? There's probably a payphone within walking distance. Yeah, I'm fine with it. You think? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, there, I'm gonna the, call from it's Gap. It's Wilmington, North from... Carolina. They probably have a payphone or two. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm gonna... sorry to throw so much shade at Wilmington, but <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Very I, nice listen, place. this is super helpful for the Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I I don't know. I just assume all cities in New York. <laughs> And uh, sure. so she's gonna call for Gab from the nearby payphone. Um, 
and okay. take it to her hotel by the airport okay. and, uh, and take a shower, get changed and everything and uh, come back. Um, and and when she checks into this. One second hotel, on that. We'll say actually right. as something does actually happen uh, as oh. you try to get back to your hotel. Oh, um, OK. <laughs> as you get out of uh, the vehicle and as you start walking in the direction of like your hotel, maybe the back entrance to where your, uh, your room might be instead of going through the lobby, you hear a sound actually. Um, you hear thoo, thoo, thoo. this kind of flapping sound uh, somewhere above you. And as you're looking up for it, you can see that there are a handful, it's nighttime now, and there are a handful of, lights in the in the parking lot and you can see that as you're looking up one of the the lamps one of the the street lamps for the parking lot just fades and then you watch about 50 feet away the next one fades and about 50 feet from that the next one fades and as you just watch like all the way around this parking lot one after the other this cascade effect and you hear, flu, flu, flu. Give me an alertness test. <laughs> I like how my train was like, I go to my room, I take a shower, everything's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that might happen. Uh, 46 we'll under uh, 50. Okay. You notice as your head spins around, and you watch all the lights and you come back kind of towards where you were starting. You look over towards the building itself. You can see off to the side, hanging from a window, you see a very large, ragged, man-sized shape that's hanging down from the side of the building. Very little light. <laughs> She is she off. Oh, do I have my messenger bag? Uh, roll a luck test to see if you managed to grab it before your car went on fire. <laughs> my gun's in there. <laughs> God damn it. Uh, luck is D100, right? D100, and you want one to 50 for a success. Uh, three. Okay, we'll say one of the things you're able to grab is oh, the bag. Oh, it rolled as Vin. It's yeah, it's fine. We know you rolled it. So yeah, maybe you still, you still have your bag. That's fine. Uh, pull pull out my uh, gun and train it on it. Okay. You see it? It's just hanging there. You have the gun pointed at it. It's hanging from a window into the hotel. Guns pointed at it. Lights are still out. What do you want to do? slowly approach as you start to approach you see the shape starts to like peel away from the building a bit and it just kind of like a little small gust of wind comes and you just see it contort almost like it just catches the wind and just begins to drift and drift further out and up and away from the building. And then you watch as it continues and almost seems to float around the corner of the building itself. Uh, I am, I'm going around the corner. <laughs> I am, I'm progressing closer to it. You move around the corner, following where you think it went. You're looking up. You're looking up. You still training the gun up there? Do you have it like up and ready, or do you have muzzle down? No, I I have it up and ready. Okay. You turn around the corner. You look up. You no longer see it, but you do hear "Oh fuck! Oh fuck!" and you can see that there is the father of a small family that are emptying out their bags from a minivan. And the kids are inside the minivan. The mom's like yelling at them or whatever. It's like, oh, ha, 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 ha. And he's got kind of like. She, oh. She's going to yell. Sir, 
Ma'am, get inside your car. Get inside the car. And okay, we'll- okay, okay. And they just start pushing. He just starts putting all of his luggage back into the minivan. And he like runs. Up, don't shoot! Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Uh, and Not he- you. Get inside the car. Get the fuck out of here. Get the fuck out of here. And he gets into the vehicle, and you hear screeching of rubber as like the tires just back out of it, and he just peels away. You look up. <laughs> And you can see that wherever you were following is invisible anymore. God damn it. I need you to roll a sand test there, Agent Ray. God damn it. You put her <laughs> gun down with a screamed fuck. <laughs> the kid starts crying on the sidewalk as he realizes his family forgot him. That's a good idea, Steven. 19 oh. under 66. That's Keep success. it together. You keep it together and then you go ahead and you can now go up to your hotel, take your shower, get ready, pack your things up and leave. Let's come back. Inferno and Price, you are heading back to the Villaggio. Uh, is that correct? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. So you too. I'm going wherever okay. Inferno tells me to. Weaver and Fuller, what's your plan? Uh, I want to start reading or at least skimming to get an idea of the terror that comes in the night by David J. Hufford. Okay. And Fuller, are you going to keep reading the other thing? Yes. Okay. Uh, So Inferno and Price, you make it back, we'll say, to the Bellagio. Um, You say you want to do a stakeout. What does that exactly tell? What do you guys want to do? Yep, there's like a a building nearby that has a nice vintage point of who enters and leaves the building. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's not a problem. Um... So you're going to stay in the car? Yeah, that's fine. Car is fine. Yeah. Price, same question. Okay. I'll uh, get us coffees to start out. Okay. Maybe also see if you guys notice any activity on the fifth floor. Okay. I'm hoping okay. that's so, included. You're specifically looking up towards the fifth floor? Okay. We're All looking right. at everything, but yeah. Yeah, I, fig- I figured. Do you guys have really good alertness and search so i think you guys would probably oh, see yeah, i do i didn't realize um so good in fact that as you leave a coffee shop nearby we'll say it is a starbucks it's it's later in the evening we'll say it's probably not a mom and pop it's just like a starbucks you pop out of the starbucks which is never a good thing to be in when you're in a delta green green that i'm running apparently that there's a lot of old history with that anyhow you come out of the starbucks and you notice as you round the corner to head back in the direction of where Inferno had parked the car, you are on a block where not a single street lamp is lit. It's completely dark. Not a single light. You don't see a single headlight of a car. You don't see a single light from uh, a building shining onto the street. You don't see a street lamp lit at all. It's just completely and utterly dark. Uh, I think it would make sense for me to have like a small pen light or something like that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I would pull that out and uh, just shine it around so I can see a little bit. Shine around. You see a couple couple cars parked on the side. There's a couple apartment buildings, much like the Villaggio, where it seems like people are maybe parallel parking outside, finding various places. It's not like a New York neighborhood, but it's it's near the beach. There's a couple blocks away. It's near a college. There's a couple blocks away. So you can see that there's some some public parking here and there. You just came around the corner from a relatively active section of the neighborhood. Cause it's not just Starbucks, but there's a couple of other restaurants and things, music playing, people going out for dinner, all that kind of stuff. There was, it was perfectly active and normal, but you didn't, you turn down this little kind of side. It's not like a long street, but it's just a sort of a street, like at the side of a downtown area where there's parking and such. And it's just completely dark. You start flashing around. Nothing. I mean, like your light goes in, you see a couple cars, they're parked. Everything looks normal other than the fact that none of these lights are on. I'll keep going. You hear something at this point with your absurdly high alertness. You hear... (laughs) Immediately spin around looking for it. And you see it coming from across the street on the other side of a couple vehicles. That's where you think it's coming from. 
You got a problem over there, buddy? <laughs> what? And you see, as you say that, two silhouettes pop up from behind one of a car. What was that? And then all of a sudden, the lights begin to flick, 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 flick. All of these lights start to suddenly, one after the other, come out. And you see you're talking to what looks like someone probably in their 20s or so, young woman, short cut hair, uh, pale skin. And you can see they're standing next to a very tall African-American man, tightly cropped hair. And the two of them are just kind of laughing. <laughs> you got a problem, buddy? I thought you were laughing at me. Sorry. Your alertness notices something else. As so you look at the two of them, you look at the shadow cast against the building wall, and you see there's his big one, his big shadow. There's a much smaller shadow. You see a third shadow right next to it, another silhouette of a person right against the wall. Start walking over to him. Looking hey for the source of the shadow. You need to calm down, man. We're just having a good time. Why, why are you, why you got to be, we got, we got such a problem, man. No, no problem. No problem. Uh, I would walk. Yeah, go ahead. set the coffee down Okay. Uh, and pull out my fake FBI badge. You two have reason to be here. This time of night? Oh, hey! Uh, you three, we're I just say. hanging out. What? what you talk about? You drunk? Are FBI allowed to drink and show their badges? And you're getting the sense that the two of them are kind of drunk. You just, you're just gonna you're gonna come over here. You're gonna flash your badge. Is that what you're gonna do? Who's you know, here with you? Is... What do you mean? Who's here with me? It's just the two of us. You three have ID. And I Who start looking around for the source about? of the shadow. As you look around, you see absolutely no source. You round the other side of the car and you look in the direction and you can see right where they're standing. You can very easily triangulate it. You do not see another person. Guys like, you know what? Fuck this. Let's get the hell out of here. And like the two of them start walking away and you watch on the wall as their shadows Start walking away. And then you watch as the third shadow suddenly scrambles in the opposite direction and blends in with some large shadow on the wall. I start going the opposite direction. Sorry, Luca, you're not getting coffee. Sand. I'm going to read your little sand. Oh my gosh. I hate having high alertness. Um, 36. <laughs> uh, 36 <laughs> under 38 just barely right, you're okay you follow into that big patch of shadow there's like a big awning overhang uh, of this what looks to be some kind of uh some kind of like packaging business and as you get underneath it like there's a big shadow there's nothing there there's nothing there. there's nothing there you continue walking and you round until you see the next that this next kind of parking block and you can see lights are on people are about some of them are there's cars coming and going some looking fishing for spots some backing up and leaving and there's no sign of the shadow you see shadows everywhere you see all these different people cast on the road on the walls here and there they're everywhere at this point God, just write it off you can't track a shadow there's no footsteps there's no uh yeah, I, I go back for the coffee I set down and start heading towards Luca and chalk it up to me being crazy again. All right, so let's check back in with Luca. Luca, you've been in the car by yourself. You've been watching. What's your alertness? 74. Okay. You see... Okay. You see a couple of people come and go. Uh, we'll say he's gone for maybe a half an hour, a little longer at Starbucks. They take too long. Uh, so maybe a little, a little longer than half an hour. Uh, but you see a couple people come and go uh, from the apartment. Some you recognize, some you don't. Uh, so you notice at one point um, when you were first in the building and you were kind of going up, you saw going up the stairs, you saw a couple. Uh, there was kind of probably in their 30s or so. Um, you saw them um, and they were kind of dressed in kind of... Um, 
you know, kind of, they had like good clothing with like band names and performer names on them and stuff like that. You can see the two of them leave. Uh, you can see at one point Todd beach comes out, uh, and he, you can see he walks around to like an alleyway, uh, by the building and stuff like that. He's kind of carrying what looks like some debris and whatnot. Like he's probably just doing his, some cleanup. Um, you see Kurt winter, uh, come back and go inside. Uh, and he's not alone at this point, as you see that there is a woman with him, uh, who you saw when you first, uh, were kind of in the, in the apartment, you saw her you kind of pass in the hallway and then she went and opened the door to the apartment across the hall, uh, from where Ronnie lives. And so you think that might be Maddie as in, you see the two of them go into the building together. Uh, let's see. You see your, uh, your frat bros, um, and then the other thing you notice, and it's because... What was your alertness again? How high is it? It's super high. 70, right? 74, yeah. That's w well plenty. You notice one other thing. That on the third floor, same floor as Ronnie, you see a little bit of light and movement on in one of the apartments. It's not, from your understanding of the building, it's not Ronnie's, and it's not. it wouldn't be Maddie's. It's a different one. You think you see a camera, like a big photographic, you know, like a, like a big photographer's camera, not some little tiny little handheld camera. And like a shutter has been drawn down and just like a bit of the camera is like pointing down here and there. And that's the only thing you see. And as the two of them, as you watch Kurt and Maddie climb the steps and go into the building, there's the faintest faintest bit of like a little tiny bit of a, a change. And so you think maybe like a, a, a camera, uh, like a picture was taken. And that is what you see. Can Nothing I, weird. Yeah. Can I triangulate what room that is from here at all? Or is it? I think so. Uh, that would probably be if, if you put, um, you know that you've met, you've seen or met three people of the four that live on that floor. You got Ronnie's room. You went over to the Mary Elizabeth Mongello's room uh, and also Matt, you know where Maddie's apartment is. You think it's the fourth one. Uh, so probably apartment 12. If Vin's not back yet, maybe I'll pay Todd a visit out back in the alley. Okay. Uh, so you get out head over the alley and you see there's Todd and he looks to be taking some, uh, some kind of construction materials and just chucking him into a, a dumpster beside here. And he turns out like, Oh shit. Need a Todd, need a hand. Uh, no, I'm all right. Um, you're the guy, you're the guy that was scaring everybody. You and the other didn't one mean to, didn't mean to scare everybody. Well, you did. Uh, people have been complaining a bit. They said uh, Kurt was telling me that you tried to ask him some some questions, and then uh, Bridget, Naomi's mom, says that your buddy friend was being a real creep. Is that about uh, it? Of a situation you we heard already. Our friend Ronnie. Yeah, really know Frank. Uh, you would know him as Frank. Yes, yeah, so you would say Frank. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We all heard about him at this point. It's a shame. It's a shame. I can't say I knew him well, but he was a he was an all right. He was a good tenant too, though. Kind of looks. I don't. I think he was a little behind on his rent. But other than that, I think he was a good guy. Uh, Miss Starrett's gonna get me to. I gotta go in there tomorrow. And start inventorying what's there. Sell off. Pay off some of the debt. So, you, Kurt says you know him. You went on vacation with him or something? Mm -hmm. Met him in Florida. Did you now? And you come up here and then he dies and you come running into the apartment like a bat out of hell? Well, it was a sudden. But sudden, huh? I'm only trying to find out what he left. What he left? Well, I haven't been in there recently, but 
Pretty sure he left a whole shitload of books and movies and all sorts of things. Guy was a bit of a hoarder. Don't get me wrong. Kept to himself. Never had too much noise or nothing like that, but I had to go in there once or twice to fix an electrical problem or plumbing problem. And yeah, it was, uh, it was something, but you know how it is. You've seen them shows, right? You get someone in here, they poke around and they find like one or two things. And all of a sudden it's like 10 grand that they sell up on the eBay. That's, so that's probably what Mrs. Sterrett's going to want us to do. Well, you probably know I've spoken to some neighbors, but I haven't got a chance to visit one of these guys and I'll note the apartment I saw. See if he knows who's in there. Uh, well, that sounds kind of stops for a second. Why do you want to go asking around? Aren't you just friends of his from Florida? Right, but he has many neighbors here, so maybe they know him. Well, yeah, they know him. They live on the same floor. Roll, roll a persuasion test. It's a weird vibe for him. Like you've got, you're yeah, like, sure. you're like, you it really is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just asking random, ten, like, who lives here? Just random just stuff. Here. He's he's <laughs> met you a few times in kind of a weird know situation. More. <laughs> I want to know more about my friend and his yeah. life. Three years, sixty-four. I can't spend luck in this game, so it's fail. Okay. Listen, man. Um, I don't think it would be appropriate. Uh, for me to just start giving out um, tenant names to a stranger. I'm sorry for your loss. You know, we're all going to be very sad, but um, I mean, I don't know. You, you could be a serial killer for all I know. Oh, so so sorry I give off that vibe. But I just. I didn't I say you things. gave off that vibe. It's just like first impression. You're running up into the apartment. You're scaring all my tenants and such. And then you're, I don't know. Then you're going into Frank's apartment and then you're interrogating Kurt. Like you guys are some kind of mod squad or something. I don't know. And then a real FBI agent shows up. So I, listen, man, he's your friend. I'm going to cut you some slack. But uh, I think maybe it's best if you just kind of wait. You know, you, if you want, you can give me your number and address. And when whoever makes the arrangements for a funeral or something will contact you, you can pay your respects, all that kind of thing. Yeah, right? I'll give him my contact. Wish okay. him pleasantries. All right. Have a good night. Have a pleasant evening. And he goes back inside. <laughs> All right, so we'll check back in with Fuller and Weaver at this point, and you two have been going through some books and such. Is that right? Yeah, it's book club time. Yep. All right. Yep. What is your int score, Weaver? Uh, my int is sixty-five percent, thirteen. Okay. Uh, it's a pretty big, thick, and complicated yeah. academic yeah. text. So. You're probably not going to be able to get through it in the night. So you're really just kind of be able to do like a quick skim. But uh, you, if you wanted to do an extended study of it, it would take probably about a week for you to really dig into it. Yeah. However, what you can basically tell uh, just by flipping through it here and there uh, is that there are about a dozen or more various hag attacks that have been collected by researchers and, uh, that seem to be both psychological researchers. So you can see there's people who have been doing psychological studies. They don't refer to it as a hag attack. They just refer to it various other terms like night terrors and things like that. But then you also notice that there are anthropological and folk and folklore components where they've collected stories and tales of people. And those are in some time, some cases actually referred to as hag attacks. And so you can see that the book is just this huge, um, this huge collection of this, of all these various attacks and things like that. Uh, and so you're, so as you're flipping through, you're just reading all these different, uh, 
uh, these different experiences that people had, some of which sound almost identical to what Inferno and Price. Some have variation. Some cases, it's people who are under uh, under actual observation at like a, a university because it was a University of Pennsylvania Press, and so some of the in some cases, it's like it's like they're under actual academic study. In other cases, it's people who are just kind of going out into various communities and collecting, uh, you know, anecdotal stories. But to get to get in to get the so I'll, I'll tell you this: like with books, as you kind of know, some of them have statistical, you know, changes, right? Yeah. Uh, that, that would take you longer than just the night. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, Fuller, you start digging further in. Uh, yours is quicker to read because mostly, because it looks like Ronnie has done a lot of the work in terms of just cribbing and finding the mm. the highlights, right? And you're just yeah, kind of flipping yeah, through. It's much quicker, and it's also not written academically. Uh, so the next one you see is in 1931, Catherine McCulley, 31. Uh, she lived in apartment 11. She commits suicide. She slit her wrist with a razor in the bathtub on January 19th. And there's not a whole lot of detail, but basically that she, it looks like she was fairly lonely and despondent for a while. Uh, there's another one in 1938, June 4th. There's a factory worker by the name of Sanford Jones, uh, 22. Uh, he was a tenant of, uh, of apartment six. Apparently he bludgeoned his wife, Judith, uh, who is 17 at the time. Uh, killing her and then when he was arrested and, and he was sort of um, interrogated he claimed that his wife Judith was seeing another man and that's why he killed her 1959 oh, there is a story about Dustin Woodley 39 living in apartment 13 he's found dead uh, on September 11th he apparently hanged himself uh, about a week earlier it seems though there was no foul play suspected uh, what is kind of intriguing about this one. And you even see like a red question mark uh, that the police are kind of baffled because Woodley's left hand uh, had been cut off after his death and it's still missing. It was never recovered. Uh, the door to his apartment was locked. His keys were inside the apartment with him, uh, but he did have a long criminal record for like breaking and entering and armed robberies and things like that. And, and Fuller is going to think for a second real quick and she's going to think back to the hand in the green box and then she's going to think about how that seemed to be a female hand and not a male hand. And that's, this that's correct. was a man. So just she's going to just think for a second. Mm, mm. And then she'll kind of go back to just sort of, as she's reading, just sort of just shaking her head at um, kind of all of this information and probably annoying Weaver as Weaver's trying to read and Fuller is just sort of like commenting aloud of, oh goodness, oh my, oh, oh, that's so sad. Oh. A couple others as well. Uh, 1960, there was a pastry chef uh, who was tenant of April uh, of apartment 16. He leapt or fell to his death from the fire escape of the building. Uh, there's no known motive for suicide and it was eventually treated as an accident. 1964, Oliver Curran, 82 years old, was found dead in his bedroom in apartment three. Uh, cause of the death was ruled as uh, a natural causes, heart failure. 1977, uh, October 20th, a college student by the name of Dewey Kilby, 22, uh, and his girlfriend, Amy Hebert, uh, 20. They were robbed and murdered in an alley behind the building by two homeless guys who were subsequently uh, caught by police in possession of Kilby's wallet. There are some inconsistencies in the prosecution's case, but both received life sentences. Uh, they, the Kilby and Hebert were never, weren't actually residents of the building, but they were like attending some kind of film noir event nearby. 1993, uh, February 25th, Corey Plainton of apartment six is shot to death 14 times in his apartment. Uh, he had a reputation for being a local drug dealer and like the cops like arrested uh, his his like rivals, uh, yeah, Forrest Benz, Joe Kirby, and Albert Kipp. Um, and then also in 1993, November 11th, there was a spinster Sunday school teacher by the name of Lorna King Kingery, 99 years old, died alone in her apartment, number 11. 
and she basically lived in the in that in the the apartment building for 39 years and her only companions at the time were a pair of black cats and authorities were unable to find any next of kin and that's the last entry okay so um fuller would want to kind of take out a piece of paper and just try to kind of pattern detect um because she kind of been asked the question earlier about like years in between or um you know month and day or any of those kind of things so she wants to um kind of try to just see if there's um kind of any sort of pattern of frequency um nothing is sort of immediately jumping out um uh, yeah, I would say you're intelligent enough to be able to deduce some things. There's no, there's no consistent interval between uh, between the deaths. Some years there's more than one. Some years there's just one. Some of them appear to be suicide. Some of them appear to be natural causes. Some of them appear to be murder. Some of them appear to be accidents. Uh, there's no real consistency there either. Age of victim, no consistency. Um, All over the place. Sex of vi- yeah. victim, same thing. Um, it sort of There's seems no initially like if anything, um, apartment 11 has two and apartment six has two. Yeah. Um, so you would know that apartment 11 is your good pal, Ronnie Lightside's apartment. Uh, and then apartment, you said six. Yeah. Six also has a couple. Yeah. You're not familiar with who, who would live there currently. Uh, All right. Yep. And so she's kind of doing what I'm doing, just like looking through all the notes, sure. just kind of mathing out, you know, kind of in between and all of we'll, that kind of good stuff. We'll check back in with Agent Ray then. Agent Ray, you've gone back into your hotel. You've taken your shower. You've gotten yourself put back together again. Um, you check out of your hotel, get a new car. When you come back out of the hotel, all the lights in the parking lot are back on. No issues. What do you want to do? Where do you head? Um, I I have my own car that I'm driving, or I'm in a cab. It's up to you. I thought you said you're going to try to rent a new car. Was that was I wrong oh, about that? No, yes, I I am. Thank you. Okay. Um, in in that case, um, heading back to the hotel, uh, to the new hotel, but I'm making uh two stops on the way. Uh, one is uh, uh, at uh, whatever bookstore is open and on the way and uh, trying sure. to buy a copy of Penny's Boat. Okay. Uh, so there is a Starbound Books, which is open, uh, which is one of those large big box stores uh, in the Barnes & Noble variety. Uh, so that th- th- it doesn't look like Nagel's is open anymore by the time you get there. Uh, when you head inside, you can hear the sounds of like smooth jazz or something like that kind of playing. There's a coffee shop nearby. There's a lot of people fake reading. Uh, all that kind of stuff is happening in here. Uh, and you're trying to get a copy of Penny's Boat, huh? Yeah. Luck would have it. They do, in fact, uh, have a copy Penny's. of Penny's Boat. It is well received. Uh, and it is many consider his best work, despite being a departure from his normal genre affair. Uh, but yeah, you're able to get a copy of it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that's one. And um, the second thing she does is uh, stop at a uh, bank and withdraw $3,000. Okay. Like a savings account or something. Okay. So you take, you go to the ATM, um, you take out a huge cash. We were talking about this, I think, um, where it will, yeah, uh, where it's going to have the potential for a, um, for an issue with your bond. Um, Would we say you are in a wealthy profession? I was looking up the average salary for, for for Ray's real life gig and I think it's reasonable it 
she'd probably have this in the savings. Um, okay. And it wouldn't, like, it's, it's a large it's amount of money, you, but it's not an it's untenable not you, amount of money. If that, yeah, but that's not what this is for. This is this is to see whether or not you're in a wealthy, it's like really like the, like how, so you're going to get it no matter what. That's not the issue. The issue is whether or not you get a chance to uh, not, like the, to roll against the potential for bond damage. So if we think. Oh, then, then I, I'm going to say no it, it it'll be noticeable that this amount is is taken out of the savings okay uh so then pick one of your bonds and just lower them by one okay if that's the case Done. yeah all the all that would have been was if if we're saying you're in like a rich profession you would get a role to potentially you know less than that or or not even have it happen yeah i uh okay i i think it's more interesting <laughs> It's so not. you got a, a wad of cash. You've got yeah. a book. Where does Ray head next? I'm going to go to the hotel and get a room. Um, I am going to uh, specifically ask for a smoking room. Smoking room? Sure, we can do that. Okay. Do you want one close to the others? Yes. Doesn't matter? Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to be adjoining, but it'll be on the same floor at the totally, very least. Totally fine. Okay. Um, do you visit Fuller and Weaver's room at that point? I'd, I'd like to say that I have um, their text, their their mm -hmm. phone, their cell phone numbers, and has gotten like on a group text or something sure. through the day. <laughs> and, uh, that sounds way message. too organized and reasonable for G Cell, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, then if they don't already have one, Ray is going to insist on having one. <laughs> okay. And um, we'll, we'll at, the, at this point, we'll send both uh, Blair and Fuller texts saying that like, I'm at the end of the hall. Um, give them a room number um, and stay, stay in the room with... Um, we had said before that she has like his journals and all the stuff they got from his apartment. She's spending the evening going through his stuff that they've already gone through. Okay. Like catching up. Sure. Yeah. All right. So we'll say that. And so you know where she is, you know, she's down the hall, Fuller Weaver, and you continue your studies. Unless there's something else the two of you wanted to do before I go back to the guys. Uh, no. Um, Fuller's just making exclamations and, and drawing numbers and, you know, checking math with Weaver occasionally of like, yeah, this Lisa's is how like many years locked and... in focus. Because okay. I think enough. one of the things that she, as she's skimming through, she would be looking for if there's any particular case related to Wilmington. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, you have not noticed one in the hours that you're going to be studying. That I've been tonight. working. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Good call though. All right, let's check back in. And we'll say Price, Inferno, both of you, maybe you return to the car at roughly the same time. Is that fair? With cold coffee. With cold coffee. Not intentionally cold, though. So, uh, what do you guys want to do? It's a bit of a creep, uh, fourth floor. What do you mean? Would I be able to see the camera, too, once he points it out? Once he points it out, yeah, it's clear as day. There's a, there's a, there's a camera up there. You want to go ask? Should we wait till morning? Spoke with Todd. He's doesn't like us poking around. I haven't met Todd yet. <laughs> he may not recognize me. <laughs> oh, the tenants have told him about you. Oh, that brat. Yeah. Uh, well, perhaps we just Stick to the plan. Stake it out for the night. In the morning. We're a little less conspicuous than people banging on doors at night. They're still at the fifth floor. We can take a look. You talk to me and do it. Let's go. <laughs> Wist in my arm. <laughs> All right. So the two of you, you head inside. Uh, you see the familiar look uh, of the the entrance way you see the mail like the mail area off to the left you see the stairs going up the elevator um 
you are fortunate enough to not have anyone in the lobby as you as you kind of push in. Um, where do you want to go? Either the stairs or the elevator that can take us up some floors. The Which stairs. One? Okay. So Hello. Start. That's how I broke my nose. It is true. No, it is true. Take the stairs. The two of you, uh, you head up the stairs. Uh, you want to, so you're going to, you want to get, are you trying to get all the way up to like the fifth floor? Is that the idea? Yeah, as high as we can get. Okay, and I have so, my pen light out because last time someone turned the lights off in the stairwell and I'm just going to be ready. Okay. Uh, you head up and you get off at the fourth floor and you see that as you do so, uh, there is, there's the smell of like someone cooking. Like you can definitely smell, um, the, uh, not entirely sure what it might be, but you can like some very potent spices and such. Uh, you can hear the sounds of like music vaguely playing, uh, but you don't see anybody like waiting for you. Now, as you got to the top of the stairs, you realize in the fourth floor, there's no, the stairs don't continue up. And so you pop out fourth floor. And as you look around, uh, you notice that there are only two apartments that are accessible. Uh, and you, as you stand between them, one of them has that smell of cooking coming from it. The other one has the sounds of sort of music being played. Uh, and then there appears to be, um, like a sealed off section uh, of the of the floor itself. And you don't see like that. You don't see like access down the hall uh, to to those other apartments. You you see like there's like a like it's almost like a makeshift wall. And then you notice that there is a padlock door that you would probably the two of you would conclude might reach a stairwell that goes up. Does it look like the two apartments here would not be the ones that are like facing the street. So these would be, hang on, let me look at my, it's the problem. I don't have my PDFs. I have to actually turn to the page. Uh, so these would be according to your, uh, according to your understanding would be the ones facing. These would be the ones that were likely underneath the floors. These would be apartments 14 and 15. Uh, and they are the ones that would be underneath apartments 18 and 19, according to the reading that Fuller was doing. Would they look like the ones that have windows, like where the camera would be? Uh, no, no. The window, uh, the the window with the camera was on the third floor. I misunderstood. Okay. See, uh, take a look every at the time, padlock, right? Every time you pick a lock, I get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> We're not picking Wrong game. This stuff. <laughs> oh, that's actually not true. In both games. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, what's it take to pick a padlock again? What skill is that? So technically, it's special. It's a craft skill yeah. in Delta Green. It's a craft locksmithing skill, which Lisa Young actually has. She has a craft locksmith, but uh, you never bring her anywhere. <laughs> no, no. this was supposed to be a stakeout uh how about you luca how do you want to get through this padlock door hmm is the wall and the door is padlocked mm -hmm. the door the wall you said looked like temporary does it look like it's something that could be like busted down easier than getting through the padlock you very much could roll either a strength times five or a craft lock picking. And we have a couple boosts left. So uh, pretty good strength. I, I could run through this. You got strength, <laughs> you want to do it? Yeah. Okay. Don't crit fail, please. What can go wrong on AD here? You don't even have to roll it if it's that high. You can easily break this down. That's not an issue. Yeah, I'm a bit of a stocky boy. <laughs> Are you really? That is not how I picture Luca. <laughs> okay. So, so sure. Yeah. If you want to, you can, without a whole lot of difficulty, look around and, and you just smash into it. Uh, 
I'll tell you what, though. Not you're gonna be successful at doing it. Give me a roll to do it. I'm curious how 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 well you do, uh, and that might affect other things. Yeah, thirty four under eighty. Okay, you're able without a whole lot of difficulty to just lower your shoulder into it, slam it into it one time, and you just feel the wall that the that this makeshift door with the padlock is in. It's it's, it's essentially it's like you know sheets of plywood painted over, and you just burst it through and so like the whole wall turns like the way a door would and like the door that is padlocked turns with it and so you're able to uh, and you look around as you, you made a little bit of noise but you don't think anyone actually heard or at least no one's responding and you see up in front right beyond the way uh, there is further access to these other apartments on this floor on the part for, on a uh, floor four and there is a staircase uh, that appears to go up. Jeez, Inferno, you're working out some stress there. No, I overshot it a bit. Let's uh, go through and try to put it back and make it look a little bit more like normal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. No one's going to come up here. Let's head to the fifth floor. Okay. I mean, okay. So you start heading up. First of all, brace it back. Yeah. No, you can can sort of prop it back up. That's fine. Uh, It's very dark in here. So you're going to need a light source as a, as you start crunching up the, the stairs, which you realize are not in particularly great shape. You notice a few things. First of all, the air is very thick, very musty. Remarkably, the smell of smoke, despite the, the fire here being like a hundred years old or whatever, it still is there. Like you can still kind of smell it as you start moving up. You can see both of you have very high alertness. So I'm just going to give it to you. It looks very undisturbed. You don't see any signs of like footprints or anything like that. It doesn't look like there's any recent traffic, anything like that. And you start moving up to apartments. You're going up to the fifth floor, right? Okay. So you head up to the fifth floor, which is apartments. 17, 18, 19, 20. Those are the four. Um, when you come up here, you feel like the floor sag a little bit with each step. Like there's, it's not in the greatest of condition. Uh, and when you move up to like the nearest apartment, it is again, it's locked. I would like you both to make an athletics test as you start moving and traversing across the fifth floor. Okay. I'm a smoker and an old man, uh, but I'm okay at athletics. Got a uh, nine. Uh, 55 under 63, so that's a crit success for me. Okay. Mine's a fail to 64. Not getting say, me today, Jeff. I will say because Price critted, at one point, Inferno, you take a step on one of these like kind of weakened floorboards from the fire, it collapses. Your leg starts to go through it. But because Price got a crit, I'll say you quickly reach out. You grab him and kind of pull him back. And you can see that your leg was about to just plunge through this section in the floor where there's all these different like rusty nails and stuff kind of kicking out. And it could have been very, very bad uh, if you would have fully pressed your leg through there. Now, as you guys start moving around, am I going to say, am I going to assume you're going to continue to just like bust doors down without any concern? Is that fair? Yeah. But I'd like to be quiet about it. Sure. I mean, like you're on the fifth floor. So as far as you know, no one lives up here. And as far as you can tell, there's no other way to get up here than by the wall that you just knocked down. So you start searching around and in some of the rooms you find like, well, actually in all, you know, a lot of the rooms it's just char and old and dust and some of them specifically the ones that have been burnt out the ones that where the fire specifically was you find a blackened love seat a charred dining room table got a burned coat rack got all these old broken uh vases got all these old newspapers that have been kind of faded and dusted over plenty of like melted civil silverware and plateware and that kind of stuff um at one point again you guys have really good search and alertness you find this pair of eyeglasses that has been cracked by the heat and at one point as you kind of pull back on a closet in a small room 
you see sitting in the closet, staring right up at you, this half-melted, charred, one-eyed doll looking right up at the two of you. You think they clean out a hundred-year fire? I turn the doll around so it's facing the other way. Okay. So you reach down and you pick up the doll and you turn it around. I just twist it. I I don't. <laughs> so you twist it so like the head could spin, but not the body. I I, I put on construction, no welding gloves first, <laughs> and then I get some tongs. <laughs> okay. All right. Noted. You turn the doll around. What else do you guys want to do up here? Start flipping through like the papers. Like you said, there are a whole bunch of newspapers and stuff like that. Yeah. A lot of them seem to be dated like the days leading up to the fire that Fuller referenced. None of them seem to have like, per- they're not all very easy to read. A lot of them have been have half burnt. Uh, some of them have faded. Some of them were just torn up a bit here and there. Uh, but you just see like, it's just basic newspapers, the business of the day in the area in the neighborhood a hundred years ago or so. Um, nothing overly uh, alarming as you go through them. None of them, the dates match up. They all match up to the dates that Fuller was seeing when she was doing the reading of what Ronnie had compiled. I'd like to head to bedroom or find the source of where the fire started. Okay. Uh, so you start heading around and you do find that there is like a um, one of these in one of the bedrooms, you can see that there's much more blackened ground floor walls. You can see everything's as you're walking. You feel your legs almost sink through a few times more, but you're able to quickly jump to the side. And in the corner of one of these, there is a utterly charred blackened chair uh, that you look at. Uh, and you're pretty sure, judging just from the burn pattern, that it likely started over there in that corner. Saying I could find in this specific area. Uh, it's all just blackened, just destroyed, black. charred, yeah. Does it look like anyone has been through this area, even like maintenance or anything? Like it's just, you said most of it seems untouched. You haven't seen any signs of footprints in the dust. You haven't seen any signs of uh, like what Inferno did, where his foot went through. Nothing. Everything looks like it hasn't been touched. Nonetheless, as you two split up and go in different directions, Price, you're looking around, you're fidgeting with the doll, Inferno is checking something out. You stand up, you turn around, and the light kind of shines around the room, and you can see a few of the furniture, like the dining room, the a dining room table, a couple of the broken chairs here and there, and casts these different different shadows on the wall. And you can see that one of them, as you stop, just doesn't make sense. As you see, there is a person's shadow right there in the room with you. And you don't see Inferno in the room with you. Even with me shining the light on it, the shadow's still there? Well, it's like a pen light, you said, right? So you're not getting right, like, this yeah. huge like spotlight. So it just sort of fades a bit here and there, but you can still see it's there. I, I want to move so I can like shine the light where the shadow like seems to be. Do you get closer? I'll go sideways, like just a better okay. angle on it. <laughs> yeah, I'll get a little it closer. Just, as you do, it just watch. It just sort of starts taking a couple steps here, there. And it starts to move kind of with you. As you're moving one way, it's kind of moving the other. You move back right, so and it I kind wanna, of moves opposite. I want to continue this move, movement uh, so that it's sort of in the way of like the room that Luca went into. Okay. And then I'm going to call for Luca. <laughs> okay. Both of you roll an athletics test. As Price, you're moving and you're moving and in front of you come kind of rushing over to try to return to, to Price. 
Uh, 29 under 63. Okay. 36 under guys, 39. Okay. And you guys both managed to avoid falling through the floors again. You come running over Inferno. And you can see as he's pointing the light over in the direction of this one wall and he's kind of shifting and moving as you come in right to the right of you, like right next to you. Cause that's what you wanted to do, Bryce. You want it on the wall. That's yeah. It's kind of like Inferno. to pin it between us. Okay. So as Inferno comes up to that, the door frame we'll say, and that, which means like the, the shadow is right to the right of him. So he steps up, you step in the, in, in Inferno, you just feel a small little, not a gust of wind, but like a, a warm breath. And it just flickers right in your hair. And you can even see it, Price, as his curly Inferno hair begins to just suddenly be tickled a bit. And you can feel it against your ear. There's not a window open, is there? You see that shadow? It's right next to you. Do I see said shadow? You look over to the right. And there is, in fact, as you peek out and behind, there is a shadow of a person on the wall right next to you. Start waving my hands in, in the air where the shadow possibly is. Okay, so you start waving it around, like cutting through. And as you do, you watch, both of you, as the, as the shadow just kind of leaps down onto the floor. And you can see it kind of slithers along the floor a bit, almost detaching itself from the wall itself. Pops up on the opposite side near the exit. And it just stands there for a moment. You see the head portion kind of turn. And as you shine the light over in the direction, it pushes towards the door into the apartment itself and kind of disappears as it as it kind of slides into that uh, that entrance way and it pushes out into the hallway of the of this floor of the fifth floor like it's running. I follow it to the hallway okay so you guys are running uh, so price you're chasing after it inferno are you chasing after it yeah I'll follow behind okay so the two of you are running 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 give me one more athletics test As you guys are running across very old burnt floor. I got a lolly on that one. So it's a nine under 63. Okay. Big failure the, for me. The two of you run price. You get out in front in front of you're coming behind in front of your leg falls through and you feel the rusted nails just rip against your skin. Uh, go ahead and take two points of damage as you just feel like your entire leg just gets shredded as your leg goes through the floor a bit. Price, you hear maybe a yelp uh, I'm of caught. pain. What do you do, Price? Do you chase or do you stay with Inferno? Uh, I look back uh, and I see him and I was a CIA special operator, so I've probably not experienced those types of injuries but i was definitely trained about them so i think i would go back to try and help him out because i know he wouldn't be able to get himself out without causing okay. more damage so you turn and you run back and you try to help him out and you're able to dislodge him we'll say we're gonna cut back to the hotel so we're back at the hotel fuller weaver you've been reading all night it's getting very very late are the two of you doing anything particular Uh, so really just sort of tallying information about like how many deaths on each floor. Um, In particular though, like I, like other than studying the book, is there anything else you wanted to do? Um, I can't think of anything immediate, uh, Weaver. I myself have been psychotically going through the notes, okay. <laughs> trying to find patterns. Um, okay. I do think uh, Weaver hasn't really, like, looked, uh, or, it's 2013. It is. Uh, never mind. Never okay. mind. And then, it Ray, the three of you have been studying in the hotel. At some point, would you three have stopped studying and, like, given up for the night? Or yeah. do you try to do an all-nighter and then we get into, like, exhaustion rules and stuff? No, at I would, least it would eventually maybe like fall asleep while reading and just cock okay. out. All right. Same with Fuller. Okay. All yeah. three of you. Okay. Yeah. Fair I would agree with that. 
Hours have passed, we'll say. Because we know stakeout, so we're not expecting them to come back tonight. And they're yeah, and they're still out. Yeah. Hours have passed. Retroactively, you may say that uh Raid had texted Vin and Luca as well. That she's checked in because I I had said that. Yeah. Oh, sweet. Okay. So you guys just, the three just of you, for everyone to know that what what room she's in. The three of you fall asleep. I need each of you to roll a POW times five, which would be so you should see if you look at your stats, it'll have like the statistic that you're and I need to know your scores and then whether or not you succeed or fail. Succeed uh thirty seven under seventy. Lisa okay. succeeds thirty one under sixty. Okay. And then Ray, how did you do? So go into the statistics tab. Got it. And then Sorry, click on POW. No, you're good. Uh, six, no, it's a failure. 85 over 70. Okay. All right. So as the three of you fall asleep, different rooms, different beds, etc. Agent Ray, you, uh, maybe you fell asleep, maybe you specifically went to bed. It's up to you. But when you wake up, you, you find yourself in the room. It looks familiar. Like you've, you've definitely, you have like a, maybe you have like a momentary lapse of like where you were because it is a brand new hotel room. So it takes like a second, but when you wake up, you suddenly feel as though two things. First, you hear these little light shuffling footsteps from the hallway, you think? But as you go to turn to look and tort your body, you're completely frozen. Arms don't move, legs don't move, head doesn't move. You've got this like like a night terror moment, like where your body just, just isn't shifting. You need to roll sand. Uh, success with that 24. Okay. You've heard the story already, right? Like this isn't surprising. Like you know what to expect. You hear the shuffling. Get closer. Go ahead and roll a pal for me again. Oh, goodness. Uh, exactly 70. Success? Okay. Yeah. You are able to like just ever so slightly kind of like tilt your head in a way where your eyes can look down towards the foot of the bed and you see this dark, hazy human shape rounding about. Can't really see the specifics at the moment, but you suddenly see the shape climb up onto the bed or hover over the bed. It's hard to deduce it. It's so dark in here. And you feel the mattress shift a bit. And this giant like shadow, but also you can see arms kind of shifting and moving this head kind of shifting this way and that. I need you to roll another sand test. Fifty-two success. Okay, take one point of sand loss as it's getting. You hear just like the shuffling, like this little clicking, almost like the the cracking of knuckles. But it's happening like in this rapid, and then it slows, and then rapid, and then slows as the shadow comes over top of you. As it does so, you can see these very dark, hazy features begin to emerge from within the shadow, like a mere inches away from your face. And there, there is this clearly malevolent grinning face 
of the old woman that you saw in your mirror earlier today. Maybe you try to move, maybe you try to talk, neither work. You're just there. And you just hear like this, like very subtle, very, very subtle laughter. And then like the, like the head portion gets very, very close against your ear. You can feel like this warm breath against your ear and you hear something. We were there when you first came into this world. Do you remember my sister held you in her arms while my sister gently opened your eyelids with her thumb and I blew the first breath into your lungs. And then the head kind of comes back and you see the grin once more. And then she leans down onto the other side of your head, to the other ear. And again, you feel that warmth. Likewise, we will be there. On your dying day, my sister will hold your hand. My sister will kiss your lips and draw the last breath from your lungs. And I... It will be my hand that stills your heart. We fade out of there. Ashley. You two wake up in the middle of the night. Except you have full control of your body. You are uh, the... The book that you've been reading is right across your chest. You fell asleep, maybe have a little kink in your neck as you have to like kind of stretch out a bit. And you can see as you're, as you're in the, in the room, maybe there's like a, a phone or a watch or a light, or maybe the light underneath the door kind of casts some very vague ambient light. But then suddenly the TV light flickers on. The TV just comes on. You look over, you can see there's Fuller. Uh -huh. The light, the TV shining across her, and you can see that she is much like you. She fell asleep studying, going through this stuff. And there's not really, you know, any reason to think that she's in any sort of trouble. You can see her chest moving up and down. She's breathing. Everything looks fine. Mm-hmm. And for a moment, the screen is just like this, this frosty snow, like static. And then you as you're watching, you can see images begin to form. And you realize there is a black and white movie that is suddenly starting to play. And like you're like okay. catching it like mid scene, something from the 40s or the 50s. Um, do you, uh, do you have any kind of art skills? Um, should be no. at the bottom if you do. Give no. me an in times one, times one. Am I able to just do? Just roll a D100 one? and you need to roll underneath whatever your in score is. Okay. Uh, that is a fail. 65 is my int score. Okay. You, you can't quite place any of the actors in the scene. You can see that there, uh, there's a woman who certainly seems to be the center of the attention and it's kind of got this Gothic feel to it. Like, a the lighting itself is, 
is very stark. You can see that she's dressed in dark clothing, dark hair. You can see that they're like she's she's sort of in a in a room, in a bedroom, and she's kind of fretting to and fro. Like to and fro. And you can see as as you're watching it, she's like talking. She, but you don't see another character in the scene. She's just talking and talking, but the sound's on. You can't hear anything. It doesn't say any, maybe grab the remote and try to un, unmute it, mute it, whatever. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. And as, as you're watching, the window in her bedroom bursts open and you can see the curtains go flying. You can see rain and wind just suddenly startle her. And right as that happens, your door bursts open and you can see this huge gust of wind just comes through, stirs some of the papers that were around where Fuller is. Uh huh. And I think settles. the moment the door like burst open, knee jerk reaction, Lisa like drops to the floor, and then she just kind of rolls to see what she's like, who's coming in. You drop to the floor. You're on the ground. You shuffle over to the edge of the bed, and you look around towards the door, and you see that there is a big black shadow in the middle of the hallway on the wall across from where the door is opened. Um, does it make sense for the shadow to be there? You don't see anyone casting it. Um, she's going to like kick the bed and nudge or try and like nudge Fuller awake. Um, but she's not going to, like, take her eyes off the shadow. She's going to grab her purse and she's going to kind of, like, head out to the door to see, to confirm. Is there anything causing the shadow? Is it, you know? You reach up. You kind of shake Fuller. And Fuller, you feel it and you wake up. Fuller, wake the fuck up. There's some <laughs> weird what? shit happening. What? Oh. Okay. Hey. Uh, I, need, what? I need you alert and active. The, like, door burst open. A, a movie did you fall asleep watching the tv last night uh and i was re i was reading but what and so fuller will just 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 just, she- just 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 follow uh in and she's gonna follow after this shadow okay so you climb up you run out the minute you start making for the doorway you can see the shadow starts shifting and moving and running down the hall by you fuller uh, yeah, Fuller grabs her shoes and grabs something that's got some Start running to it. down, yeah. running down. You get to the end of the hall. We'll say you're on the second floor. Get to the end of the hall, interior hallway. And you can see that the shadow just moves up against the door. And then you can see it just kind of seeps in through a seam in the frame of the door itself until it's gone. So like... Outside or into a room? It's like an in. So it's an interior hallway into an interior uh-huh. staircase that'll go probably up two more flights and then down one more. Uh, yeah. Lisa's gonna keep following for the time being. Fuller's okay. right behind. All right. What are your alertness rolls? Oh. Like, what are you guys are at? Forty. Right. Forty. Uh, Forty is respectable. Thirty-three. And not ridiculous like some people in the party. <laughs> So the two of you, uh, you follow once or twice. You get a glimpse, maybe of what you think might be the shadow. You go down to the next, you go down like the one flight of stairs and you curve back and go down to the next. You push the door open and you see it opens up onto the back patio of the hotel. You can see that there is a handful of lights that are up here or there. You can see that there is like a, an iron rot, fence of some kind that seems to curve around the the pool and like the seating area you can see that there's a couple places where um like someone has like folded down an umbrella for the night and the two of you i'll say 40 anything over 30 is good for this you notice yeah so you notice that there is a figure sitting at a table back to you but you can see like every now and then there's like a light of an orange as if someone's like smoking a cigarette or something and you can see it's kind of drifting up 
And then with 40 fuller, you notice that the shirt is tropical. Wait, then Fuller just sort of leans to Beaver. That's a tropical shirt and a cigarette? Uh, Ronnie? He's a ways out. He's like on the other side of the rod fence. He's next to the pool. Do you go out there? Yes. Fuller sort of looks at Weaver. Yeah. 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 Should I? Yeah. 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 Okay. So we kind of go closer. To you. Go over top of the iron front, iron fence. No one else is around. You walk past the, the pool. Lighted. Well kept. You curve around and you see like shrouded in this gloom, but still very identifiable as Ronnie. There he is sitting there in this plastic chair, tropical shirt. He's got a cigar in his hand and he just kind of looks up at the two of you vaguely and he says, yeah, you should have left her alone. Looks over towards Lisa. Sorry, kid. You should have left her alone. But, uh, just saw her. Um, she killed you. We saw her. You should have left her alone. She's seen you too. Kind of looks over towards. He looks over towards Weaver again, and he's just like, "Sorry, kid." And then over back towards Fuller. What? Yeah, she is. But you followed her first. Just remember that. And Fuller, like, walks around to the other side to see if he kind of follows. What did, what did you, you do? You say, what are we playing, ring around the rosy? We, we <sighs> have your journal. What did you, what did you do? Your last, your last entry. Uh, I did a lot of things, kid. The last thing I did was... Well, I kicked it. That's what I did. So, so the the sisters, the, the and she'll gives it the name the salmon, the sisters. Those are the sisters. Elizabeth. It's a long and, draft. You see this, like like a little bit of like red, kind of shows up there as he takes his pull drag. Yeah. Yeah, the sisters. Yep. And I think and he kind of I, looks up. He, he looks over at Weaver at this point, and you could tell, like every time he looks at Weaver, he's just like, "Sorry, kid." And at this point, like Weaver is crying, because <laughs> like he's he's dead. This is jarring to see him and be able to speak to him. Hey, no, none of that. No tears. That's not how this works. How does this work? You're dead. We're we're trying. We we have your scrapbook. We're trying to follow it. What? What couldn't you do that we can do before she kills us too? You know, uh, your file says you're uh, you're first in your class. Good on you. Uh, thank you. Hey, you're welcome. I should have gave out more praise when I had the chance, you know? Should have been nicer. Should have been kinder. You know? You, you were, you were plenty supportive. Don't, don't worry about that. Is, is well, it? Well, not just to you, but, you know, everyone, you know? 
They teach you to, uh, you know, keep a distance. But I was keeping distance long before that, you know? You know, they brought Penny in, right? You can see, like, he, a little smile comes to his face. Yeah. Yeah, she saw Penny, too. It gets kind of sad. And then as you guys are standing here, you watch as the lights in the pool start to flicker. And the lights around the patio start to flicker. And he looks around. He's like, oh, she's calling me. She has, she has control of you? Sorry, kid. And he just watches. He just kind of fades into darkness. And then both of you instantly poof, wake up in your beds. You feel you're still there. Everything's there. Papers are there. Look at each other. The TV pops on again. And you just see static. And that's where we're going to stop for tonight. God damn it. Oh. Keep your socks out of the green box. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I should have, oh, make sure you don't take the socks out of the green box. Whatever you do, don't take them. You should have warned you. <laughs> I'm a piece of shit, that guy. It's a shared space. Pick up your laundry, dude. Yeah. He's like, did you guys not know what a green box is? Right? You put dangerous <laughs> shit in there, you don't take dangerous shit out. Oh goodness! Anyhow, oh, there we go. You don't learn that. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Oh fuck. <laughs> fucking Christ! <laughs> I love Delta Green. Yeah. Serious. I know. All right. Wasn't sure who was gonna get it. I wasn't. That's, that's why at Joe I wasn't sure who was gonna get different things. So fun little stuff. Oh. So we've got the guys oh. who are at the apartment. Uh, they looked, they scoped out some of the burnt places, ran into like the shadow thingy. Um, Inferno got his leg, got a boo-boo on his leg. Uh, Price went back to save him. Look at you. I thought for sure you would chase after it. I thought for sure you would chase after it, but you went back to help him. And then, um, yeah. And then back to the hotel. Weird stuff happened. That's that. Okay. So, uh, but yeah, that's it. That's it for the night. Why don't we go ahead and do some closing plugs? Uh, and we'll get on out of here. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Maitre. Maitre, can you tell us uh, where we can find you on the internet? Holy crap. I, I guess. <laughs> I'm uh, my who plays games on, on YouTube. And I make system agnostic. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just I'm so like anxious and like amazed about this game. Like I'm having so many feelings. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> my dear plays games on YouTube. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect, fantastic. Check the notes and everything. You'll have links to everything. Steven, sir, what you like is there a about? place someone can find me on the internet too? Uh, there is. Yeah. Yeah, uh, huckleberryrpg.com. Uh, go there, uh, and uh, if you sign up, you will get the free quick start to my RPG when it comes out, and you might get some digital goodies uh, sent straight to your inbox ahead of time. Uh, we've got some things in the works. Uh, we've got some cool art. We've got some cool uh, people working on the RPG. Someone might be working on it who's also on the stream. Uh, oh, wait, there might be two people on the stream that are also working on it aside from Long, me. what are you doing absolutely nothing no, <laughs> <laughs> he's doing Long day fast. training and funding it that's what he's doing <laughs> uh yeah so uh go to the website uh and uh sign up so you get the free quick start uh which uh should be coming out august 1st is the plan. That's the new release date that I am announcing right now exclusively on Adventures in Lollygagging. Very cool, man. Very cool. Very exciting. Uh, and also, uh, head over to Discord. Our Discord. You can get both Adventures Lollygagging stuff, but also you can sign up for Huckleberry playtests and things. We're still doing that, too. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, so when you join the Discord, 
Uh, you have to accept the rules. Uh, you click on the little cowboy hat, and it gives you a playtest roll. Uh, and you get to go to the playtest channels, and I'm going to be running at least one playtest a week up until August 1st when it releases. Uh, possibly more, depending on my schedule. Sometimes, maybe even three, four, five times. No, probably you have a not schedule? Many, but we'll try. Uh, I, I plan it five days in advance. That boy. <laughs> but yeah, uh, in anyone who's on the Discord can sign up. It's free. You don't have to buy anything or anything like that. Uh, so come play games with us. Fantastic, man. Uh, and as for the rest of us, next game is tomorrow. You'll see this exact same crew playing more Lovecraft, weird crap stuff, except we're playing Call of Cthulhu tomorrow. We're in L.A. It's 1936, but they're probably all still going to go insane. Indoor get shot. One of the two. Uh, Monday, you can see a few of us here. My Trey, Melissa, myself playing some Alien. Uh, Alien RPG from Free League. Very excited to get back to that. Uh, Steven, what are we doing on Tuesday? Tuesday, we are finishing Perils and Princesses. Uh, so uh, last week we made some princesses uh, and we put them in peril. And now we are going to uh, get them out of peril uh, and possibly even end with a wedding. Uh, we're we're looking for love. So we'll see. Let's hope so. Fingers Let's crossed. Let's hope so. I'm just, I've been brainstorming different boat names for our, our princes uh, this past week. So that's fine. <laughs> and uh, let's see. Boat. Rowboat. Rowboat, tugboat, dreamboat, sailboat, uh, motorboat. That's my favorite. <laughs> Ashley Long, Melissa, know why. Yeah. Uh, and it's not what you think, you creeps. Okay. Other than that, uh, what else we got going on? Thursday next week, we'll be back to Simber Room. Friday next week, we'll be back to Warhammer 40K, Wrath and Glory. If you haven't already followed the channel here on Twitch, please do so. If you uh, haven't gone over to the YouTube channel, Adventures in Lollygagging, check that out as well. Uh, drop us a sub there, like a video, drop a comment, all sorts of fun things. Uh, and if you're listening to this on the podcast feed, we appreciate you as well. Thank you so much. Hop into the Discord, say hi, talk about what games you like, what games you hate, what games you'd like this to see uh, more on the channel in the future. Uh, otherwise, we're going to get out of here. We're going to rate our buddies over at Defenders of Cobard. Our friend Joe is uh, is making a game called Anvia, and he's running that game right now. So we're going to go uh, support him and say hi and uh, make fun of him for uh, no particular reason. Uh, that's just what we do. Bye. Bye. <laughs>